Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and I'm very glad you're joining us again today. Today, we're going to have another very interesting show. I have invited an old friend and colleague of mine, Barry Goldstein, to be a guest on the show today. And it will be for the radio show as well as for the TV show, because we're in the age of COVID and everything is by Zoom. So we're going to zoom in on a lot of Barry's experience and know-how in the world of music. It's really profound work that he's been doing. He is the author of this book, The Secret Language of the Heart, which is a musical story. And he'll be laying out what that really means in just a few moments. I wanna share with you a little of his accomplishments and bio because it's really, it's so beautiful and so, uh, so impressive. Uh, Barry's musical experience, and by the way, he is originally a New Yorker, spans many styles and genres from co-producing the Grammy award-winning track 69 Freedom Special with Les Paul for Best Rock Instrument, uh, Instrumental to providing ambient music for Shirley MacLaine. For those of you who don't know who Les Paul is, he's one of the most famous originators of one of the great rock guitars. So it's... Uh, that must have been a real blessing to do that with Les. Uh, Barry's music is being used in hospitals, hospices, cancer centers, and medical practices. In addition, Barry reached the Billboard Top 10 albums of the New Age charts with New York Times bestselling authors Neil Donald Walsh, Anita Mojani, Dr. Joby Dispenza, and Dr. Daniel Amen. Uh, the Bright Minds music program he developed with Dr. Amen was part of the number one PBS special Memory Rescue. He has also received the Coalition of Visionary Resources Awards for Best Music of the Year in 2017 and 18, and Best Self-Help Book in 2017. So Barry, you have just accomplished so much in your musical artistic life, and you're bringing that into the world of healing. I mean, it is healing in its own right. I think people really need to get that that's the thing about music. It's healing in whatever space, but you then targeted it toward specific medical and overall therapeutic as well as spiritual, how do I say, advancement. And uh, I think that's just really very much to your credit. And I, I honor you for that. Well, thank you. Thank, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to, to talk to you. We've been talking about doing this for a long time. Oh, God. And it's been a long, long time coming. We didn't do it when I was in New York, so I'm, I'm uh, excited to be here with you So today. good, Barry. It's funny, because what was that? And to talk more about music. And exactly, singing. exactly. The funny thing is, of course, we met many years ago when I was the MC. I think it was when we first met or we may have meant before that, but we really connected for the Earth Day event at the Meta Center, for those of you in New York City who remember the Meta Center, uh, Andrew Kane's Planet Heart uh, Earth Day and World Peace event. You were performing, singing, guitar, and I yeah, was... Yeah, no, I remember it. It was at Jody, Jody Sirota's Meta Center. Yeah, well, beautiful, beautiful place. Exactly, exactly. We miss it, truly. We miss it. She had to give it up, but we all long for it, let me tell you. So go into a little bit about uh, the work you've been describing in the sacred language of the heart. I think that the, the secret language and the sacred language, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, that was a good mistake. Um, that is. That's a better title. <laughs> Next one, the sequel. <laughs> I'll help you write it. <laughs> one of the things I really like about your work, I mean, number one, I got to really get a dose of it uh, a few years back at Joe Dispenza's uh, advanced workshop in Seattle and Tacoma. And because then you were providing s the backbone, if you will, uh, to the entire workshop, the whole training was really rooted musically. I mean, needless to say, um, I mean, from an experiential point of view, needless to say, you know, what Joe had to share uh, intellectually um, and didactically with us all is of, of, of incredible value and it sets the stage. But the music you did gave us the chance to really catapult ourselves 
into the understanding through our bodies. So would you talk a little bit about what you did in that space and sure, what's yeah. your mindset? What are you thinking about when you're putting all of that together? Well, it's an interesting process because it's, it's kind of in between thinking and being at the same time. You know, so um, Joe Dispenza, for those of people who don't know him, you know, he is, he's very much um, tuned into music and the effect of it. And I think that's really why I got called into the process. He was using my music uh, in some of his events to get people into a, a more coherent alpha state. And then we talked about, wow, what if we try to do this live? So uh, doing it live was, was pretty amazing because the audience becomes part of the composition, really. Mm. And uh, when he's taking people into a meditation, him and I are really um, in the definition of synergy. So synergy to me is doing something that is beyond yourself that you could have done by yourself. And right, it's taking your work and somebody else's and putting something together that is more powerful than you could have done individually. And that really is what we what we're doing. Joe reads the audience um, and I'm reading the audience at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we're connecting to that field. You know, we're we're moving from a place where where people's energy isn't coherent to start off with. And we're taking them into a level where they're slowing down their brain waves. Yes. They're more into their heart space and moving from the brain to the heart allowing themselves to open up and it's a beautiful thing you know he's kind of like conducting it and i'm feeling the audience he's feeling the audience and we're creating a composition live in that moment that is really unique only in that moment to benefit the participants and you can really feel that energy when the music and the, the group kind of start coming together and they start moving into that coherent space. You can feel it in the room. You can feel the energy shift. You can feel people coming into that space. That's right. Uh, you know, that is more beneficial to where we started with. And um, it was a very unique experience because I kind of have to be paying attention um, and feeling the audience. So you're in, you know, you're in both your right and left brain at the same time. Sure. Because I need to stay connected to that field and bring it in and be in the heart, you know, but at the same time, I have to be paying attention to what's going on. Yes. So uh, exactly. it's, an, it's a, a very interesting dance and one that was very unique to, um, you know, my career and creating that live with it was a beautiful thing. Well, you know, I mean, I was a participant, so I can report back and in fact i did right during it and after to you uh joe had always wanted to do improvisation he, when he was playing piano as a youngster I, yeah. I was just reading in the forward of your book and uh he never really got there because he had to practice the scales and i know because i started studying piano just so i could play jazz and i didn't get there either i mean i got there a little bit in college but you know, you have to get rooted, as you so well know, Barry, in the classics, technique, etc., before you can start to blast off. But what you two were doing is really, you, you described it as synergy. I think that's very right on. But it's also the, the art and the essence of improv. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You are right there riding the wave of the energy field, as you said, of the group. And that brings our field into the larger field, if you will, that you are sensing your way through. Joe is as well. And we've created this, this incubator, if you will. It's very, yeah. Yeah, please. absolutely. Yeah, I, I think a lot of what, um, you know, Joe teaches is about connecting to that field of the unknown. Yeah. And so what's beautiful all about it, you know, yeah. yeah, and the, you know, the unlimited field of all potential, that's where the good stuff, right, the gumbo lays is in that <laughs> unknown, yes. and not the known. So right. we're moving from, you know, out of matter and into that larger field. And so what's beautiful, you know, in, in this day and age is to see a teacher walking his walk, you know, in that moment, neither one of us know 
what's going yeah. to happen next. So we exactly. are exactly what we say, you know, practicing what you preach. We're in that unknown that's because right. I don't even know the next note that's coming, you know, until my fingers are hitting the keys. And so, yeah. you know, tapping into that field of the unknown is what I'm learning more and more, you know, throughout my career is that creative field um, that we're connecting to is where the essence of all of our growth and, and important breakthroughs come because we're connecting into the energy of the creator, right? When we're in tapping into our creative self, we're tapping into creator, you know, and there are no limits um, when you do that. You're in that field of all possibilities. And it's, it's really a beautiful part of thing. You know, I have to say, in hearing all that you're saying and having experienced it directly, I start to reflect on the great jazz musicians of all time who are, you know, largely black over the course of the 20th century when jazz really, you know, bloomed and blossomed. And it's like the secret club of deeply spiritual dudes who never really let anyone else know what they're really up to because their language was music yeah you know yep. and they might not even be all that verbally articulate about what they're doing but when they get into that improvisational space that you were so nicely describing just now barry they are in an altered state, man. They are so inwardly coherent, inwardly, but also as a group. And anyone listening that can tune into that level is just grooving on that wave, if you will. You know, yeah. so I'm just kind of saying that here with all of our spiritual lingo and everything, um, and the so called, which I don't like at all, new age. A vernacular these dudes were doing it all along for the past hundred years you know <laughs> that's you right know what I mean? that's in right. clubs and yeah. bars etc that's right and you know that's funny it is and you know that's an important part and i think it's a, an important conversation you know because i think it's easy yeah. to fall into um you know to, to fall into the the lingo you know, within the, the new thought or new age community, yes. you know, in terms of, um, you know, oversimplifying sometimes the essence of music. Music is a very complex system, you know, and um, these guys that you're talking about as well, you know, when they're tapping into that, you keyed upon one of the most beautiful things is that when they're in that state, they're sharing that field, you know, That's so right. within that recording, you know, you're feeling them in that moment. And 50 years later, when you listen to Bird, you know, play a sax solo, you're there with them in that moment because within that music are subtle energies that are communicated, that are, are recorded, you know, right. and, and that cannot be replicated. You know, so it's all about really is what you're tapping into, not necessarily the genre you know, I, I think there's a recipe to it, you know, and within that musical system that we're talking about, the complexity of it and why it can be so healing is because it's, it's tapping into what I call a four body system, mm -hmm. you know, which is your not just your um, your emotional, but it's your spiritual, your mental and your physical body. You're feeling it in your body. And that's why music can be so profound and so healing because it hits Absolutely. all of those. And Absolutely. when. We, you know, when we can break through in even one of those bodies, you know, that's when the capacity of healing occurs and we can have a breakthrough. Yeah. Now, yeah, absolutely. And of course, you really elaborate on that idea in your book, which is, you know, beautiful. And so, hence, out of the physical level, we get the emergence of dance and the need to move. And the music inspires us to move, whether it's the rhythm or the lyricism, the melody, the harmony, all of it is reaching a different part of us. In the introduction, Barry, of uh, the newsletter for this week, A Better World Newsletter, I was introducing you, and one of the things I said is that music is so organic to us, mind, body, and soul, in short, 
uh, that um, we call these things inside of us organs. Mm -hmm. You know, and because I have a background in traditional Chinese medicine, we talk about the notes and the tones and even the instruments that correspond with each of the organs and meridians. That's I saw that, yeah. How I refined the ancient Chinese understanding was of these interconnected relationships, you know? And Absolutely, yeah. Of course, you're talking about that so much in your book and through the work you do every single day. Talk yeah, about and that, so. if you would. Science catching up. I mean, to the spiritual aspects of all this. You know, That's we're right. seeing these in studies now, and uh, you know, talking about Chinese Chinese uh, medicine as well. You know, the uh, the original symbol for Chinese medicine incorporated the sign, the symbol of music within it. it is is the symbol so? of oh yes, and so I didn't know were, it is. Yeah, so it, it was intertwined for thousands of years. And we're learning now, you know, even in, in acupuncture as, as it's beginning to be used in more modern ways, mm -hmm. that when you combine music with acupuncture in treatments, it's more beneficial than either one of them alone. So, the, you know, they're dancing in partnership. And it makes what you total talked about, sense to me. Yeah, and yeah, what you please. talked about with jazz musicians too, and, and um, you know the improvisations, we're seeing that now in brain scans. You know that what are you um, saying? divergent thinking, you know, or the creative, happens in the part of the brain that is connected to improvisation, and so jazz, but also interestingly enough, in freestyle rap. So there's a recent wow. study that showed that I'm not surprised. Yeah, if you're reading lyrics, you know, if you're re reading your rhymes, you know, if you're a rapper, it doesn't have the same effect as what's called freestyling, which is basically improvisational, where you're just going off the cup, you're making up rhymes as you're going along. It's opening up that same area of the brain that jazz musicians were using for improvising, you know, in the 40s, same things. So again, as I'm saying, science is catching up to what we knew or what we know instinctively instinctively yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly that's really really cool and if you think about it which you know joe likes to do i like to do many do who appreciate the nuances of neurophysiology as it relates to mind um we have the cutting of new neural pathways when we do something new it requires an entire new bioelectrical, biohormonal, biochemical activity that we have generated, something novel, as Terence McKenna would say, which expands the mind and literally also the brain. Exactly. Yeah, and they and that's part of you know what what uh, like Dr. Daniel Amen, who I who I've worked yes. with, who who is cutting edge in terms of how to keep your brain alive. alive. You know relative to memory, cognition. Yeah, and one of the things he recommends is learning a new language or learning an instrument, you know, and of course music is a language. You know, when we're learning music or learning a new instrument, we're, you know, we're keeping fresh, you know, and we're connecting those pathways that you're, you're talking about where we're firing and wiring, you know, in our brain. And that's a great way to keep the brain more active. Exactly, exactly. Walk us through a little bit, if you would, Barry, uh, what you've done um, with the use of not just hemispheric coherence in the brain, but something that you and I are both very fond of, uh, which is the Institute of Heart Math, um, and creating heart coherence. And tell us a little bit more about that. We had, you know, a few of the folks from Heart Math on the show, my God. 10 some odd years ago. So yeah. it's really nice to get a refresher and how specifically music plays a role in that. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you know this, but the, the, the founder of HeartMath, Doc Shidre, was um, actually a musician and was very oh. much, yeah, he I did uh, yeah, was very much founded on those, on those principles. So, um, you know, HeartMath talks about tapping into those emotions of gratitude, kindness, compassion, and they've showed, you know, what happens to our EKGs when we're doing that, right? When we're in those 
elevated emotions of kindness, compassion, gratitude. We're moving into those mo more smooth. Love. Love. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. That, um, I, want to, I want to measure humor, by the way, because I think that love to, and humor together create the, the bonding force of the universe. Absolutely. And, you know, humor, too, creates, you know, the beneficial hormones that are in our, in our bodies, dopamine, the pleasure, you know, pleasure hormones, all of that that are beneficial. So laughter is a, a, and I consider laughter a sound as part of sound healing. And oh. actually, the wander from you. Nice. But, yeah, I got, I got nice. um, certified in laughter yoga when I started becoming a sound, you know, working with sound, because I thought it was an integral part of, of how sounds could be used as well. But uh, moving back to the, the heart myth principles, sure. you know, when we're moving into those smooth, oily heart rhythms, what's yes. coherent based upon, what's going on in our physical body is that we're moving into what's called a parasympathetic state. So th this is when our body's um, in a more relaxed state, you know, as opposed to the sympathetic state where we're running from the bear, right? We're in stress. We have things to do. Uh, Reptilian. Exactly. The parasympathetic state is when we're giving our body a chance to slow down, rejuvenate, detox, we digest better. This is where all the healing, you know, really comes in. Home. So we, home, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so we're, how do we get there? You know, and there's lots of ways to get there. But for me, music is a no brainer. You know, it's, all, it's an all harder. Right? That's kind of funny. I like yeah. that. Yeah. And it really is because. You know, we listen to a piece of music, um, and we uh, we really, if it's if it's a piece of music that we know affects. If you wouldn't mind, move slightly to one uh, direction because we want to get your whole full punam. Yeah, I got. As I we got, say in I Chinese. Got excited there, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. So, <laughs> yeah, thank go ahead. You. So, yeah, so music really takes us there in a way that really nothing else does. You know, because we don't have to think about it. You. You hear a piece of music um, that that affects you. You're moving to those states of kindness, compassion, those coherent states. And I'll give you a great example. You know, for me, mm -hmm. um, the other day, I, I you know, within within what's going on now, you know, of being kind of quarantined and in the same space, you know, for for the last almost ninety days, you know, I asked myself, what piece of music do I really want to hear right now? that's going to take me to the state that we're talking about. Yes. And what clicked into me was some of my older music that I used to love to listen to growing up in the 70s, you know, and I downloaded all of um, James Taylor's greatest hits, Jackson Brown's greatest hits, Cat Stevens' greatest hits, right? And I made this the most incredible playlist. And I mean, within probably, I would say 30 seconds of listening to James Taylor, Fire and Rain, I could feel my heart space expanding and moving out of my thought process, right? And the Native Americans say it best, you know, the longest journey you'll ever take is from your mind to your heart. That was a journey I, I really that. felt, that I, yeah, that I really wanted to take in that moment. I felt like I was contracted, right? So how do I move to a more expansive heart state where my heart becomes the conductor to the rest of my body the systems that are going on. And so a little bit of James Taylor did it for me. Then I listened to um, a little Deva Pramal, Love is Space, yeah. um, love that album. And then I uh, actually listened to a new album that I, I released um, like two weeks ago called um, Lay Down in Love. Mm. And a lot of the music on that is composed at 60 beats per minute, which yes. is where our hearts are at a relaxed state in the parasympathetic so, state yeah you have the ability and your heart has the ability to adapt to tempo you know and a lot of people experience when they're working out you know they listen to music that is much more up tempo to get their heart moving and it works the same way when we want to slow down when we want to sure. bridge our hearts to more relaxed states we can target that and that's one of the things that i've done within my music you know, as target those heart states at 60 beats per minute. So your breathing starts to slow down. You start to move into more, these more smooth, orderly rhythms. And your breathing starts to adapt to it. And you start to be the conductor of your own inner symphony. 
right? So your heart is orchestrating that tempo that's being sent out to your digestive system, it's being sent out to in your endocrine system, right. to all of your systems. And it's really slowing things down and you're moving to these states where things are more orderly. And it's that's almost like a metronome. It is just like a metronome. And, um, you know, they, there's a study in my book that talks about that, that even there was a study that was done that showed even when people listen to a metronome at s about 66 beats per minute. So our relaxed state is anywhere between 60 and 70. But even listening to just that metronome alone without the music, you know, took people to that state where they were experiencing less anxiety and less stress. So if we take that next step, and I've applied that to music that has longer tones, right? Less melody, so you're not thinking a lot, no lyrics, right, in that state. And it really, um, you know, takes you to a state where you're just slowing down your, your heart's rhythm. But at the same time, when you're doing that, what's going on in the brain is you're moving into slower brainwave states. Definitely. At, as your heart moves Alpha, into the theta, maybe delta. even delta, right? Yeah, music becomes the bridge to move sure. to those states. And then we become the, the, the conductor being able to target those states. Where do I want to go? Where does my brain want to go, right? Does it, do I want to be in alpha and a relaxed state? Do I want to move to theta and move into more creative states? Um, and we can begin to target this with music really as the vehicle to take us to the states where we can be more creative. And I, that's how I view it. For me, it's always been a vehicle to take us to places where we can be more creative, where we can share our gifts. So no matter what your gift is, you know, I believe that we're all here to share a gift. How do we spend more time in those states, right? Where we, can, uh, where we can share those gifts, spend less energy getting there. And you know, that's where music as a vehicle for transformation, especially now where you know, we're moving through some heavier energies. I have found that my savior within moving through those um, heavier states is to be in the more creative states more frequently. And the more frequently we can be in them, right? No unintended. Right. <laughs> right. The more frequently, and that's where frequency is. It's a repetitive yeah. cycle. So if we can stay in that state more frequently, right, then we're tapping into the frequency of whatever it is that we want to be in. Yeah. So we're the bridge, and it's up to us to True. take ourselves there, you know, and to become our own sound healers, to find out what music, you know, vibrates with you, you know, and what takes you to those states where you can tap into your own giftedness, because it's not the same for all of us, Mitchell. It's not, you know, it's not just a prescription for this um, specific frequency for all of us. You know, sure. you have to feel what's right for you. And then each composition that you listen to, and I ask myself this all the time, is this taking me to a more expansive state where you know i feel like i'm on the you know the top of a mountain with this unlimited field horizon yeah yeah or is it taking me to a more contracted state sure you know where i feel like i'm closing up and we can tell you know someone recommends a piece of music for you you know what i want to share with your listeners and an important message yeah even though it might be something that is you know like a buzz phrase like this this is going to take you there um, because it's at this specific frequency, right? And I'm, I'm not saying that it's not going to. Um, you know, I think that there's, that, that there's a lot to be said for different frequencies, um, mm -hmm. you know, opening up different vessels and vehicles for us. Chakras, etc. Absolutely. Yes. But it's also about the composition, you know, within sure. that piece of music. And you have to ask yourself in everything you listen to, your own discretion has to come in into each of those decisions, whether a piece of music is going to work for you. And it, it's, does it make me feel more expansive when I listen to it? Do I feel like energy is coming in and I'm connected to something larger than myself or it may not for you, you know, we're not all 
you know, the same beings. What and, you're saying, you know, Mary, if I could, because this is just one sure. of the things that I do, is yeah. take what somebody's saying and then put it together. Psychobio individuality. Yes. That's it. We, we yeah. have, a, each of us has a different, you could say in this case, musical appetite. And it's Perfect. not just, as you're saying, one size fits all, and yet, but it's also even ourselves at different times of the day, at different days of the week, of different weeks of the season, we are modulating energy. And therefore, there are moments when I really want to hear Beethoven's ninth. I really want that feeling. And other yep. times, I want Edgar Winter and Johnny Winter and Tobacco Road. Exactly. And, and that might switch, you know, because we're constantly changing that vibration. That's the point. You, know, you, might, you might the next day not, you know, enjoy that at all. You exactly. know, so that's perfect. And I love that you um, described it as musical appetite because that's how I think of it. Uh -huh. I think of music as nutrition. You know? Yes. Right. We're, we're yes. supplying ourselves with True. musical nutrition. Yep. And um, like you said, at different times of the day, just like our meals, we want to nourish ourselves in different ways. It's like eating the same food all the time. You're not going to do it. You need or you might be allergic. It, you or know, you so might be allergic. I want to go say, back to something yeah. that you were saying before. Two things, actually. When we were talking about the metronome and the 60 beats per minute for the heart, which is its decent, balanced, uh, parasympathetic rate, um, I was also thinking about the Native American drum beat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I remember getting into a sweat lodge, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, and everybody coheres to that drum beat, and your body just starts to slowly move like this. In fact, I've done it in Arizona, down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, um, just because I say that because you're out there. Um, you know, there's this incredible, profound feeling from the simplest drumbeat. So that just underscores the point here. Yeah, and that's called entrainment. You know, it's so when uh, exactly. our internal rhythm matches an external rhythm. Yeah, right? Right. and it becomes one. It becomes, it becomes a unified one. field. Now there's something else you said when you were talking about putting together that playlist uh, yeah. from the 70s. Uh, I've done that too. And I find my entire, you know, I used to know Edgar Winter, as I mentioned him, because I produced a concert of his in the 70s when I was in high school. And there was this feeling in tuning into him. He, certainly his album, Save the Planet, which is sort of like one of my hobbies, you could say, yeah. um, a better world at all. So there's this feeling like, oh yeah, this is great. I remember this and because our body remembers the vibration and it remembers it's got physical muscle memory of music people well, yeah let's talk that about way. that let's what? talk about that. that's awesome yeah, let's talk about that sure here's here's something great for you to know too another synchronicity between us so yeah. you work with edgar winter i also work with edgar winter he was on the track that i worked with, with les paul oh god so 69 oh, feet great edgar winter played the saxophone on that track so yeah. When so, was this? What year? 2005. Oh, God. 2005. You know, yeah. he moved to Westport, Connecticut, where I grew up back then after our concert with him, Barry, because he said to me in my living room, uh, no, in the kitchen, smoking pot, which I had to get special permission from my father to do back then. <laughs> Dad, can I smoke? Paul with Edgar <laughs> Mitchell. I've got to. He's a rock star, Dad. Please, I said, be careful, Mitch. <laughs> well, your dad, your dad was ahead of mine then. Yeah, he was <laughs> pretty <laughs> cool. He was pretty cool. And my my mother twisting his arm too. <laughs> but uh, but he ended up. He said, Mitch, I have never been to a concert where everybody was out of their seat and clapping. Talk about synchronization. Um, before I even got on stage, this is a very cool place. And he moved to Westport after that. Anyway, that's well, just a side yeah, and story. You know, but for you though, that's gonna that come, might come in down the line for you. You know, in 
yeah. hopefully, you know, 50 years from now, if you ever needed it. But what they're showing now is we're talking about is called preferred music, right? And so they're incorporating this into music programs hmm. for people who have dementia and Alzheimer's. Oh, I know where you're going with this. Yes. Yeah. And ahead. so asking their relatives, you know, what kind of music did this, did um, your dad like when he 30 years ago, because that's what we want to connect him to. And what they're seeing is that the, this preferred music is opening up these pathways where, you know, you could ask the, the person, hey, what was mom wearing 30 years ago? And there's a blank look, there's no connection there. But if you play White Christmas from that 30 years ago, all of a sudden he remembers everything. Exactly. So this preferred Alive music- Live inside. Yes, with Henry, exactly, yes. Right, exactly. So, yeah. He doesn't remember his own daughter's name. But when they put on Duke Ellington, he's like, oh, yeah, man, I got it. He remembers everything. Right. So I know I did an interview with the, uh, the producer or director of that many yeah, years Dan ago. Dan Cohn. Yeah, yeah who exactly. was part of the social worker. Yeah. Yeah. Your listeners who don't know, that, look, up, look up Henry and Alzheimer's on YouTube, and you'll see a great video that what, what Mitchell and I are talking about. But it's, it's really the perfect example of um, you know, how – music and not necessarily music we would think of as healing within the you know the new age community or the new thought community um because it's not necessarily meditative or mm -hmm. you know using those instruments it's not about that you know all the time it's not about genre as you were saying before it's not about genre it's about what what's going to work for you exactly. to create healing you know and so we need to look at it in a in a different capacity you know where we're creating playlists and we're creating programs that you can use every day, you know, of your life, just like meditation, you know, it doesn't become powerful until you incorporate it and you lock it into a daily thing. It's the same thing with music. So even for, you know, your, your listeners who are, who don't, they like music, but it's just random experiences where they're having their healing, mm -hmm. you know, it becomes more powerful when, we incorporate even the simplest of programs, which I say, if you can, if you really just want to start a simple program that's profound and powerful three times a day, you know, a song in the morning to start your day, whether it's, you know, your, your Edgar Winter or whether it's Diva Pramal, you know, or whether it's listening to singing bowls or it's listening to pentatonics, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, start your day and use a piece of music to create your intention for the day. So music becomes the chalice of how your day is held. Oh, beautiful. Right? What are you, oh, uh, maybe you're, yeah, maybe you're in a leadership role and you want to listen to, um, you know, some Vangelis to tap you into something really powerful. Yeah. Whatever that is, ask yourself how you want to start your day. And then in the middle of your day, just like lunch, you know, we nourish ourselves and we want to revitalize our energy in the midday, you know, maybe our day snowballed and we've had some challenges and we're starting to move out of our intention. Mm -hmm. What piece of music is going to take you back in? And maybe it's that Native American drum, drum that's going to synchronize you or resynchronize you. Or maybe uh, I like to listen to different pieces of music from around the world. Yes. You know, and take myself on a five minute vacation yes. outside of my environment. You know, listen to a piece of music from the Orient you know, to change things up. We're reading my mind. Yeah. Or I'm actually thinking awesome. about classical Indian music that moment. Yeah. So you, you really take that journey there. You close your eyes and wow, for five minutes, you're away from the four walls, you know, of wherever you are. And that's a great way to break the middle of your day up. You know, so I, that's your midday song. And then at night, you know, I think of night kind of like dessert, you know, after dinner. <laughs> You know, you want something sweet, something, yeah. you know, to bridge your busy, you know, mind, you know, from those beta busy brain waves. You want to start winding down. And, you know, and guys like Edgar Casey talked about that, you know, that music is a bridge. Mm -hmm. So if you constantly are asking yourself during your day, where am I now? Where do I want to go? Right. So maybe I'm depressed and I want to go to a more elevated state yeah. or maybe I'm, maybe I'm in a very busy state and I want to go to a more wound down state. And what piece of music is going to take me there? Yeah. What piece of music is going to bridge that?
So in the evening, I like to um, slow down, put on a, a piece of music that's at about 60 beats per minute, that's gonna slow my breath down, slow my brain waves down. And they're actually showing that in studies, you know, that that's the best kind of music for sleep. Yeah, I was just gonna bring that up, right. You know, is that music that's slowing down, not a you lot of melody. You need the lower hertz rate for that to happen. Yeah, and the lower also, low and slow, you know, low so and those, slow. Yeah. low and slow, so those lower frequencies, the nice, bassy earth tones that yeah. you know kind of round us in low and slow really kind of work well with with both the heart and the brain so we move out of the thinking mind right and we reconnect i like to review my day you know in that process of you know what do i have to be thankful today yeah before i go to sleep what do what do i what did i learn today what were my challenges how did i walk, work through them so that we're not going through the same cycle every day. We're releasing some of our energies and our challenges before we go to sleep. And when we can do that, you know, it takes us, um, it takes us into more sound and sacred sleep because yeah. you've, you've processed a lot of your day. Your mind doesn't have to be as active, active. Right. you know, in your sleep process. Really. So just three, songs you know a day and of course if you want to expand upon that and incorporate chanting in your day you know and oming you know we've we've yeah. seen in new studies that ohm um they they actually took fmri studies where they've taken scans of the brain and they've had groups chanting s just a regular syllable of s really and then chanting ohm and they found that the, the group that chanted S had absolutely no benefit, you know, of, of moving into a more peaceful state. And the group that chanted OM moved into what's called um, the uh, limbic deactivation. So the, the limbic part of the brain that's associated with peacefulness and inner peace and quieting down was activated and lit up in those fMRI studies through the chanting of OM. Mm, that is awesome you know so, you're reminding me of uh, a well-known experiment that actually don campbell who ah, yes. yeah you remember don campbell right the mozart oh, effect etc i interviewed him back in the mid 90s barry on his on his work with music and healing um and one of the stories i believe that he told me or someone was of that you probably know of the um uh, the monks in the south of France who received an order from the Vatican to stop chanting so they could spend more time making Sleeping. Yes. wine yeah. or, right, or yeah. something and be more monetarily productive, which is not the first thing you think about when you think of a monk. But so they stopped chanting and then they actually, so many of them started to get sick, digestive disorders, migraines, uh, yes. neurasthenic disorders of one sort or another. And they brought in a famous doctor. Um, his name is escaping me right now. But he came and he studied the phenomenon because they, they didn't bring him in because they stopped chanting. They brought him in because he no, they were complaining so much bodily and physically and emotionally of the stress, etc. And when he did his diagnosis, well, what's changed between now and before? It was the missing key element, which you're implying with everything you do, music, and in this case, chanting. So he said, you know what? Let's try an experiment. Let's bring the chanting back. We know the answer. Yeah. Cleared up. Cleared up. But I will say, too, let's, let's add even another element to that as yeah. well you know, even outside of that physical, yeah, the chanting was a, a physical part of, you know, why they were staying healthy and, you know, they were staying focused. And emotionally. But, yeah. yeah, but really also one of the ingredients to that healing as well is the intention. You know, where are they when they're chanting? They're just not in a mindless state. That's right. right? They're in a connected state where they are so focused on the divine. And that Absolutely. is the mechanism of how they get there, which for me, I think is one of the, you know, the reasons and one of the blueprints of why music was created, you know, that we've, 
we've lost sight of is, is to connect us. It's, it's a bridge to yeah. our virtual connection. And that's what was missing from, for them. It wasn't just the, the basis of singing, right. but it was that intention, the emotion. And singing with purpose for yes. connection, as you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's you know, truly also, fundamental to the healing that took place. Yeah. Yeah, even um, you know, when, in the Jewish tradition, when, uh, when, when the Jewish people are davening right, or praying, they're moving in a rhythm with their body that's going into that as Synchronization well. Synchronization and the words and the, the speaking of right. the prayer. And There's a whole bodily movement that's going within that, that's oh, yeah. part of that prayer. Your whole body's into it. You're connecting right. with the divine. So I think that's uh, you know, another missing piece that we don't talk about uh, enough when we're talking about, well, what makes a piece of music healing? Mm -hmm. you know, someone listens to it. And I think that's an integral part of it is I know that before I go in to create a piece of music, that if I'm not in the emotional state of where my intention is, then there's not an alignment there. So in other words, if, if I'm intending to be in a space of love, but I've had an, an argument or I had a, a conversation that didn't go well on the phone and I go into the studio, that intention is not going to be in alignment with my emotion because I'm not there emotionally. You know, so it's the same, it's the same thing. Very everything, important point. Everything goes into that recording. You know, it's the harmonics, it's the beautiful melodies, right, that goes into it. It's the tempo, it's the frequencies, right? It's all of it. But the secret ingredient is making sure that you're matching, you know, in your emotional state, that intention. And, you know, that's why, you know, you can hear a piece of music performed by 20 different artists, right? And not have the same effect, the same piece of music. Why is that? You know, why is it that you hear, wow, I can hear his heart and soul yeah. in that piece of music? Exactly. Because they, they were in it. They're not just playing the notes on the that's page. Right. Mechanically, if you right. will. They're moved by it, you know? And those are the subtle things that go into a recording that create a field, a shared field. Right. That's right. That's shared with the listener. Exactly. Even if that's it's codified in a CD or a vinyl or whatever it is, doesn't matter. This is a transcendent quality you're referring to here, Barry, that goes beyond the medium, if you will. Right. And that's why I think why they, you know, why I think they called them records originally, right? Because they are records of where we are yeah. in that moment of time, where we were emotionally when we wrote Record that song. of the experience, exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's recording those subtle energies are the most important part. You know, I compare it and I talk about this in the book because people ask me a lot, well, what frequencies do you use? What's your secrets? Yeah. I said, you know what? I can give you the recipe. But it's just like grandma's meatballs, you know, <laughs> right? I can give you the recipe and write it down for you. Or gefilte fish, as the case may be. Or gefilte fish, <laughs> right? And you can go exactly by the recipe, but it doesn't taste exactly like grandma's, right? right? Why is that? Because we're all unique. We're all right. have a different vibration that's going into grandma's that. Grandma's love, Barry. It's your grandma's love. Grandma's you know, part of it, you know, when you asked before about uh, the work I do with Joe, this is comes yeah. kind of back around full circle, is I think part of why those meatballs or that gefilte fish tastes so amazing, that love that we're talking about, mm -hmm. is because grandma was imagining her granddaughters and grandkids and her son and her daughter eating that food and the gefilte fish, right? Yeah. And how they were going to enjoy it. Before it even happened. we're going to feel. That's right. That elevated emotion. And exactly. so when I'm composing music now, like if I'm doing music for one of um, Dr. Joe's walking uh, pieces, oh, yeah. you know, or, you know, Anita Morjani's, you know, uh, a near-death near experience meditation, mm -hmm. I'm tapping into the feel of the people already receiving that meditation. I'm yes. seeing that walking meditation, having sure. breakthrough. You know, I'm seeing him walking in different countries, you know, because Dr. Joe, you know, goes, travels the world. Over. I'm seeing people receiving it in, in Anita's meditations in India and in Hong Kong, you know, and I'm seeing them having breakthroughs. I'm seeing them moving to a place where they're 
souls are evolving from listening to this body of work. And I think that's where the beautiful synergies and partnerships now are so important coming in, you know, in joining with other people and other leaders to create bodies of work together, you know, yeah. who understand the importance of, so. of the verbiage, you know, the intention, the emotion, the music, it's all part of grandma's recipe, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think that's really true. I want to just point something out in what you're saying so I can kind of tease out an implication of this. You are, and also with my background in psychology, I think of these things, which is that you are an empathetic soul. And that's part of what informs your musicality and your skill and your brilliance with it. So what does that mean in this context? When you're given an assignment like, uh, do some composition for my walking meditation or my near death experience. You have the ability, Barry, because of a fluidity in your nature to put yourself into the shoes of the listener, the ultimate receiver, and see what it's like for them to be experiencing that moment with that music. And so that gives, there's, see, there's some people who say, this is what I do, this is how I make music, and there are going to be some people who love it and some people who don't, and so be it. I'm contrasting that with what you're saying, which is that given us an assignment, you say, okay, what is that feeling tone going to be like when they hear this music in that context of a walking meditation say? And so you're able to graft yourself through your powerful imagination which I think is God's greatest gift to us, right into their shoes. And then indeed they do experience it as you intend them to hear it. Yeah. With me? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, tapping into them, having the experience ahead of time and yes. feeling, you know, feeling uh, blessed in the moment of recording, you know, is an important part of the process to to um, to be in that space because if we can feel blessed by what we have to offer and how that's going out to people and yeah. be blessed for whatever gift it is that we've been given you know for me that's it's about the dharma and the life purpose mm -hmm. of, of, of really why what is this being used for for me my purpose is to awaken my own giftedness obviously throughout this process but i feel that everybody is in their divinity and their sacredness and their own glory when they can tap into their own gifts and what they're blessed by. We all have, it. you know, we all have a unique vibration or what I call our heart code. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, it's a piece of music or a meditation that can create an aha moment or a breakthrough where someone realizes that, you know, someone watching this show, you know, who decides in this moment, I'm going to step forward and, share my giftedness because it's needed right now in Absolutely. on the planet whatever that is you know People that's touched by this dialogue they feel uplifted they all of a sudden feel spontaneously creative they take a look at their own lives and see what it is they're they've been doing and then what they really want to do what their heart is really bidding them to do to do that they've been in denial about to one extent or another yeah I mean, I think that's it. And, and the first step is walking with the divine, you know, with it. So if you can walk with the divine and your creation, you know, you're always supported and music can be a vehicle to get you there. And sometimes we need a wake up call. You know, for me, you know, I was a type A producer in New York City, <laughs> yeah. you know, taking a hundred hours to record a five minute song, you know, and so you're it was saying through, your book, right. It was through my own healing process that I started to connect to this music, you know, that I'm now putting out there for my own, to move back to my own heart. Your own healing and your own heart, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, also in the midst of that, in the midst of my fork in the road, you know, where I was kind of still labeling, oh, this is my spiritual music. Uh -huh. This is my pop music. This is my right? commercial music, my make money right. music. Yeah. Right. In the midst of that, you know, I saw Wayne Dyer uh, at, a, at a conference and, you know, in the, in the middle of that conference, 
he had a quote that's very famous and, and he said, don't die with your music still in you. I know. And I remember hearing that and saying, you know what? I can't serve two masters. It's not about this is my spiritual music or this is my pop music. It's all the same. It's all spiritually connected. And that's when I, I kind of decided to take the wall down. As long as I put my soul and myself into, into that, that's going out there, it's all spiritual. You know, so a lot of us create these, create these dividers of how things need to look for exactly. us to achieve them. When this happens, then I'll do this, right? But when we're connected to that, to that field again, and we're just allowing it to come through, and we're inviting God, the divine, whatever you want to call it, you know, in to co-create with us what I, you know, call divine collaborations, then we're never going to, going to experience um, creative blocks, you know, because we're creating yeah. with source. And that's really the difference. You'll find that when you invite that divinity to create with you, whether it's a song, whether it's a business plan, whether it's a piece of art, it's all tapping into that same creative energy to spark your giftedness, you know, whatever it is. Absolutely. I want to bring something else up here because if you go back and listen to our, you know, delicious dialogue talking about music as nutrition, um, there are two camps, if you will. One is the listening, receiving to music, to sound, to rhythm, and the effect it has on us as a passive recipient. And mm -hmm. you've outlined beautifully the many kinds of effects it has uh, on sleep patterns, on restfulness, on peace, on creativity, on running, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is the active role of actually creating the music, playing or playing through song, playing our organs, so to speak. You know, in other words, making the music. So there's the receiving and then there's the making. And these are two distinct, but both incredibly medicinal healing modes. So could you say a little, I, and right before yeah. I invite you to say something, I want to, when you use the word Dharma, I was reminded, Barry, of uh, something I learned long ago when I was uh, actively studying yoga as I, I really young as a teenager when I began. And the Indians have this extraordinary way of describing what happens physiologically in Sanskrit, which is not that, my Sanskrit's not that good, but there are certain things that happen in the throat that then stimulate in turn the brain and the higher functions like the pineal and pituitary glands through speaking. And then that is then enhanced further when chanting. But even through speaking, you know, you find those people who just are sort of in love with the sound of their own voice. We're all probably guilty of that a little bit here or there. But, you know, there are just people who just talk. And it does, what they're saying doesn't have a whole lot of content, really. But they're talking. Now, there's, there are lots of reasons behind them. I'm not going to go into that right now. But there's a certain calming effect for some people some of the time that that has. So, too, with chanting... There is the release of certain biochemistry in the throat that connects to the brain through harmonizing and through chanting. So I just, if you would comment a little bit on these, these points. Yeah, so your point one, we're, we're talking about active and, and passive listening. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's a, a distinction for that is, that's really important. So I can, um, even as a listener, right, someone who's listening to my music or listening to their, a piece of music that moves them, <clears throat> I, still, I still think that they can listen to that actively. So even though they haven't composed it. Nice. Right? 
they're not a passive listener within it. And there's a different stage of listening when you reach that stage where it's active listening within it. So the big distinction, Mitchell, with that is that music is not something that happens to us. Okay. okay. So that's the passive act yes. aspect. Music is something that happens in us. Oh, nice. Okay, so when you're listening to a piece of music and you're actively involved, it's going on within your body as well. And that's why I said, ask yourself the question, is, is this um, creating expansion if, you know, to see if a piece of music resonates with you? And that's really a great term because when something resonates, it's amplifying something that's there. It's already there. Right, so like okay. when you hit a tuning fork in a room with a piano, right? <clears throat> Um, and you hear the piano, all of a sudden, that tone vibrates the string of the harp together. That's reson It's called resonating, right? right? It's creating a more powerful vibration by the two. And that's what happens in your physical body when you hear a piece of music that, that is really active, you know, it makes you an active listener. You're hearing it on another level, not just with the ears but with your whole physical body, you're like, oh my God, when you play that piece of music, I felt something open up in my heart or I felt a block. My neck's been stiff for like exactly you know, two days. I felt something released there, you know, and that's really what you're talking about as well. Yes. With the effect of, you know, chanting mm -hmm. um, or voicing, you know, what's going on in our physical bodies, you know, as well is you know within our energy centers or our chakras our voice is a way that we communicate our truth you know as well so when we're chanting or singing we're expanding you know our our physical aspects of our voice and when you're actively involved in that all of a sudden you reach a point where you're moving out of your thought process mm -hmm. right and that's why mantra and chanting are so powerful you're moving into a place where you're moving into your autonomic nervous system and that's kicking in because you're moving out of the thinking mind and it's automatically moving into a state of trance. Yes. Exactly. Right. And when you're moving into that state of trance, what's happening what's so important in your physical body is those beneficial hormones, you know, dopamine, uh, even oxytocin, the hugging, you know, the hugging hormone, the all these hormone. The love hormone, right? All of these things are being produced. I love the love hormone. There you go. Even by loving the love hormone, you're probably <laughs> experiencing it right now. Exactly. So you're all of these things up that you know that have been done for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. you know, that intuitively, that, intuitively, um, that we're still learning about. You know, uh, when right. someone's having that spiritual experience. You know, and their and their brain, they're they're you know they're looking at fMRI studies of, of monks chanting. They're they're seeing them going into gamma, you know, um, which is a f even faster brainwave state. And they're they're having a hard time explaining this. Why, Dr. Is Richard that? Davidson? I know I discussed it with him. It's yeah, brilliant, amazing work so, with the Dalai Lama's uh, uh, bevy of Tibetan monks. They did those studies. Yeah. So, I mean, we're just, you know, what you and I are talking about here, everyone's shaking their head probably going, yeah, we've known this for thousands of years. Why do we keep talking about science catching up to it? You know, because we're... Because it's we're, fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, why. Um, science is a language too, Mitchell, yeah. you know? And so some people need that science to feel safe. That's right. You know, so when I'm, when I'm uh, lecturing and in, in doing medical lectures, that are geared towards CME, where doctors are receiving credits for it. Mm -hmm. right? Talking about all of this, people are like, what is this guy doing here? He's a musician. He's not a doctor, right? And I'm talking about chanting, and mm -hmm. then I'm showing them the studies. I'm showing them the fMRI oh. um, slides that were done. They say, well, this is what happens when the brain chanting ohm. Yeah. And then I ask them, would you like to try it? Let's put this let's put this science into an experiential process. Are you up for it? And watching 200 doctors stand up, and I have a chant that I created called Om Shalom Home, <laughs> right? That was um, actually inspired by friends of yours, um, JJ Hertog. Oh. Uh -huh. I did, and they talked about seed syllables that weave through many different yes. languages. Om is one of those, right? It weaves through many different languages. Sure. Jerusalem, Om. 
om, home, shalom, right? Exactly. Oh, is that interesting? And not only that, most of the doctors that you're lecturing are probably Jewish. Who knows? <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't know. There's they're pretty diversified. But having them stand up and in and Indian, <laughs> yeah. and Indian, right? And sing and watching them spread their arms out, watching them put their hands oh, on their heart. Beautiful. You know, this is why we talk about science you know combined with the spiritual aspects of it and being the bridge and why it's so important because if you can give them a moment where now they feel safe enough you know to say oh that makes sense okay when i do that i'm in a state of inner peace it's creating limbic deactivation the hero uh, uh, hemodynamic correlation of own chanting hemodynamic wow. right wow so what i know it's great going on. word yeah i know what's hemodynamic. going on in my brain right um and all of a sudden, they've they allow themselves to take a journey where they're having an experience that they can then share with their patients, you know, and yeah. and they're and and now they pass it on to their patients. This is really cool. There's a study behind it, but just try this with me. Let's just chant together. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's where we have the breakthroughs of of reaching beyond the choir, you know, because most of the people who probably, you know, watch interviews like this with, are the choir. They understand it. Yes. But it's getting it to people who don't necessarily understand it, how they can incorporate it. And that's really, you know, where the science becomes more important as well as a language to translate to people to allow them to have an experience. Absolutely. Really nicely put. Your familiarity with the science of the music and its effect, its therapeutic medicinal effect, gives you an entree into that world with your skill set, which you might not otherwise have. So science becomes the, uh, the bridge and the opening of the door so you can get into those medical contexts and be yeah. heard and listen to and as our dear friend joe dispenza is always saying science is the new language of the mystic that's right and there's a whole other really interesting aspect to underlying everything that we're saying here barry which is the fact that music is also a very beautiful expression of mathematics Yes, all exactly. of it is predicated on math. And, you know, then we get such beautiful constructions such as sacred geometry. We get, you know, it's, it's an architecture in itself that just like a cathedral is based on sound math. <laughs> no pun intended here. I, maybe you could say a few words about this. Yeah, and I mean, that's what we're... we're seeing more and more of too as well that you know this combination of of the two music is one of the only things uh the arts that we know that can actually stimulate both sides of the brain because of exactly what you said yeah. because creative aspects right and the improvisational aspects but also the math part, part of it as well so that when we talked about how the state i was in when i was composing for those live events Yes. Those that's the that's the part of where both sides of the brain are being active, you know, within that, within the math, mm -hmm. within improvisational uh, improvisational aspects of it. Again, you know, music is a very is very very complex. And the more we study it, the more we're seeing that aspect of it. Yeah. But also, it's very very simple. <laughs> so to break it can down, be, can be, yeah, it can be very simple. Heartbeat. And yeah, the heart, right, for me, is the common denominator. And what's so beautiful about seeing those doctors having that experience mm -hmm. is seeing them move into that space where they're opening their heart spaces to receive. And this is where it takes their work to the next level, it takes my work to the next level. It's all about connecting to, you know, one of the oldest technologies, but one of still the most cutting edge, oldest, most spiritual technologies that we have is our heart. You know, and when you connect with your heart and oh. your, 
in that space of having that experience and you know the brain follows you know and the other way around the other way around when you feed the brain like you do you know you gave the science and now the brain can access that aspect of it the, the part that had to know right and can tap into the part that doesn't need to know which is in the heart it's a knowing without knowing you know it's the intuition and that's really you know what the book and my book was about the secret language of the heart how can we access the heart using that using the science of it but also you know using music using sound using vibration using specific techniques to begin to have that conversation again and that's the conversation we need to have you know in our society right now you know is the conversation where we're in engaging with our heart because when we speak to our heart right. our heart starts to speak back and then we have this conversation the when we ask our, in fact yeah ask your heart a question you start to get an answer and then you start to have this conversation and what is that called it's called intuition that's right right as and, you so. beautifully i'm sorry no no go ahead okay as you beautifully quote that Native American wisdom saying in the book and here of the longest journey is from the mind to or brain to the heart uh, is so true. It also should be said that a Native American understanding as well and indigenous throughout the world is this idea of do what your heart bid thee to do without mm -hmm. the old English do what your heart bid thee. So that means, and that implies something, and this is where science has buttressed our fundamental intuitive understanding, that the heart actually has some 30 to 40,000 neuroreceptor sites. It's actually its <laughs> own autonomous brain, literally speaking. It can function separate from the head brain. In Chinese medicine, Barry, we don't even talk about the skull containing the brain. We talk about the heart containing the brain. Shen, which is related to spirit. It's the storehouse of the spirit. The brain that we refer to inside the skull is called the sea of marrow. It's not <laughs> even, it's a whole different thing full of intelligence by the way because marrow is highly intelligent of course red blood cells and a whole lot of things but kidney energy chi etc but it's a whole different world so i just want to bring this up and just as we have neuroreceptor sites in our microbiome in our gut so we start to see a whole different holistic anatomy here and physiology different than what we've been taught and again it lines up more with a larger indigenous understanding an ancient understanding of the nature of the body body mind and reality itself it's it, it changes everything if you will yeah and, and we're learning more and more it's not either or you know Correct. it's not you know it's it's both you know so it's we're talking more now about heart brain coherence right and what you were talking about as well we're seeing more studies that are are looking at well what happens when our hearts in that state what's going on in the brain and we've seen some new research that's indicating that when we're in these coherent coherent heart states that our brain is producing more alpha brain waves uh -huh. so there's you know there is a conversation that's going on between the heart and the brain and it doesn't yeah. it doesn't really matter does it which which one we get to first right whether our heart moves to a more coherent state and it affects the brain right or we slow our brain waves down you know by using specific technologies and that puts us in a space to relax and open our heart more it doesn't it's matter not a competition it's all right. part of the sacred physiology absolutely could you say something no, I, I very much appreciate that relative to the work you've done with heart math and the use of the um their technologies for for measuring heart coherence what have you found with your music and 
particular therapeutic outcomes. For instance, when people have had insomnia or other types of illnesses, problems, disorders, and how heart coherence has helped to alleviate these. And the heart coherence, of course, in this context, being um, increased, enhanced through music. Yeah, so I haven't personally done research in conjunction with the Heart Method Institute, just so, you know, so yeah. I don't have indicators that, you know, from their met methodology that would sh show, you know, what happened when you listen to my music for what they, they're doing. But what through with okay. the context of my work and applying, you know, um, the specific techniques to get to heart coherence mm -hmm. through music, right? So I've taken their research and then applied music of utilizing music as a bridge to get there using my own methodologies. I see. Just to be well, clear. Then, oh, no, I yeah. appreciate that. Then what do you yeah. find with your music, music in general, I'd love to, because I know you know this, but also your music in particular, uh, the effects that it's had. I mean, do you have like specific stories, for instance, of people who have had oh, sleeping yeah. problems and Oh yeah, migraines or what have you. Could you just share before I yeah. let you go? I want to just get a couple of stories. Yeah, I mean, of this. yeah and and just to also be clear too, there was some um, data that was taken as well at Dr. Um, Joe's events that are basically yeah. showing that in conjunction, uh, music and the meditations together, you know, where they're brain mapping people, and and Dr. Joe talks about that, you know, in the forward of the book. How does he know that people are moving to these coherent brainwave states because they took the, the data from it? In other words, yes. while people are listening to this music sure. and meditations, well, there's it's a baseline before people start the program. So oh, I know yeah, they're moving to <laughs> alpha states, you know, in, yeah. in sometimes within, you know, seconds, their brainwaves are shifting. So it's very powerful. But um, also within, within my work, it's been my music has been used within um, dementia, you know, for people to uh, feel less anxious and more, less agitated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also been used in the circle of life. So my series Ambiology, which is all composed at oh. 60 beats per minute, has been used to birth children into the world by midwives. Um, and it's also been Beautiful. used for souls passing, you know, in hospice. So it's been in, used in the circle of life to move oh. people to that more, um, to a calmer state where they're, they're, they're free of those heavier emotions that create incoherence, you know, such as fear, anxiety, sure. anger. If you're able to release some of those during um, the process, transitions. transitions, and bring, you know, bringing a child into the world. So I feel blessed to, my music has been part of, um, that you know, the so beautiful of life with all that. But it's also been used um, with children in schools um, during resting hours. It's been used for, for kids with ADHD, like children on the spectrum of autism as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, I started creating that music in 2002. And as I said, it was basically for my own healing process. I didn't know how it was going to ripple out mm. and how the CDs were going to be used. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it's being used for insomnia. I'm part of a study now with a, a cancer center, a big cancer center. I can't say their name yet because it's still, it's still in um, the developmental stages, but it's being used to study sleep patterns uh, in cancer patients as well. Because obviously when we're going through chemo treatments, you know, a lot of the challenges um, that we go through are within sleep and insomnia and that takes our immune systems down. So anything that we can do to help build that immune system up is beneficial. And my music's being used in that capacity as well. So you can see some of um, testimonials and endorsements on my website. There's a lot of them that are um, documented in the book as well in what I call musical prescriptions for health, which is um, the last part of the book is really kind of looking at how music can be used medically to prescribe um, you know, specific music for specific conditions. And I think really that's the exciting part of where we're going, where I'm going with my work as well, is we're moving to that place in modern medicine where music is being studied more. And um, Steven Sinatra, who's um, mm -hmm. a actual, he's a, um, a 
cardiologist, but he believes in the holistic aspect. Holistic he's been calling, yeah, he's been calling what I, I've been doing acousticeuticals. So, which he views as the next stage of That's where excellent. we're going, you know, with this is, wow, music's low cost. It's non-invasive, um, no side effects. Why aren't we using this more? Well, the side effects are the kind of effects you want to have. Positive, that's right. Positive <laughs> yeah. side so Makes you want so to dance things like that <laughs> yeah exactly so that's where i'm going with this how can we break through more medically that is teach tradition more about this how can we take this to the next level with using it for pets you know to um for for pets to experience less anxiety by using music you know i'm looking at something along with are, a little cbd oil perhaps <laughs> yeah whatever yeah, you know, but, there's something that to be beneficial and, and these areas and we're learning more and more about these technologies so sure. um, that's what's exciting to it. me so, that is yeah. so beautiful do you use you know you're reminding me of another holistic physician who i was very fond of dr mitch gainer uh who, i knew you were going to mention him did you really yeah I you know I, you, would. you know mitchell I, i'll tell you um I had the, the privilege of meeting with Mitchell Gaynor before he passed. I think it was about six months before he passed. Oh, wow. And a friend of mine, um, you know, facilitated the meeting. And we had a, a, myself, my wife, who's a, a naturopathic medical doctor, and Mitchell mm -hmm. sat down. And we had uh, an amazing conversation. For those of you who don't know, Mitchell was very, um, very, um, influential on in bringing crystal bowls into more mainstream and what they can do for healing. And he was, you know, he was, um, actually a doctor. He was a, uh, an MD. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was working real with renowned. Him. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, um, and Mitchell, uh, and I were talking about uh, collaboration. He, uh, listened to my music. I gave him all my music. He, he emailed me back. He said, I listened to your music. I went on a binge and listened to your music for 12 hours. And he said, I believe that there's something here yeah. um, in terms of what we can do together. Therapeutically. Uh, and, um, you know, he was writing his book at the time. I was, I was writing mine. We got caught up in, you know, in the busyness. And I'm so sorry that we didn't have a chance to collaborate, you know, before. Sure. Before his passing. Um, but I. I'm uh, sad. What a I loss. Think his, his work oh, was very powerful. Mitch also, and I'm like you, I have a certain regret, which I didn't uh, uh, interview him, but I did get to meet him a couple of times up in his beautiful apartment, actually, uh, chanting, as a matter of fact. Um, he had a certain um, Indian guru that he was very fond of, and I got invited to his place for some activities and meditation and chanting so Beautiful. but he was on that path you know as a person and as an emboldened healer with what he was doing yeah. like you were saying the use of the of the crystal bowls and a pioneer you know a yeah pioneer. oh by all means exactly you know, you have to be willing a lot of, of these these amazing people and i feel so lucky that I've been able to work with like Dr. Daniel Amen, like Dr. Joe, yes. like Anita right. or Johnny, yeah. like, you know, they're, they're pioneers. And there comes a point where you can't be afraid of, you know, uh, whose feelings you might hurt in the process of moving into creating new, um, new innovations and breaking through, you know, into out of the tradition and moving out of the, the boxes. And I really believe that Mitchell was a pioneer in wanting to bring this forward. So I think we're, we're here. I'm glad we had a chance to talk to him more about people who don't know about his work. That's right. You to know. honor him. Exactly. Watch him on, on uh, the Dr. Oz show. You know, he was actually on Dr. Oz. With yes. Crystal right. Ball. And watch the work of Dr. Daniel Amen as well. Oh, you I've know. seen it many times. I, you know, yeah. beautiful, yeah. beautiful work. Now, do you use or have you used Barry? Uh, binaural beat in any of the work that you've done? I, I have. Had I have, the yeah. chance to become quite familiar with it back in the mid 1980s, quite honestly, because I had uh, been engaged by a man back then known as Brother Charles, who later became 
Master Charles, but back when he was Brother Charles and we knew him as BC, had been the uh, had been the personal secretary of Baba Muktananda, and while he was there, he was recording chants, and he then later analyzed them from a frequency point of view. He then studied at the Monroe Institute down in Virginia, where they were using sound and binaural beat to help people have an experience outside of their body, so-called astral projection, etc. And yes. Brother Charles learned that. He put together this whole thing called the synchronicity experience. I don't know if you knew that, but I mm. represented this back in New York in 1986 for a couple of years. And it was using sound. He took chants from all of the leading uh, faith traditions of the world, wisdom traditions, set them to sound and binaural beat, put, and then put in uh, subliminals having to do with I am one with the universe and all of that. And uh, it was very beautiful. And it would bring you into a deep alpha, theta, and delta state. It was designed that way. So you would have these profound experiences. By the way, it happens to be seven o'clock in New York City. And talking about sound and music as we are, can you hear what's going on outside? I cannot. Is it church bells? Or bells, pots and pans being banged. Every oh, wow. seven o'clock. Every day, p.m., we all clap and bang on pots and pans and make music to thank the health care workers and all of the transit workers and the garbage men and everyone who is keeping our city going during this age of COVID. Mm -hmm. And it's this beautiful <laughs> five-minute outpouring. And we happen to have a, an amazing trumpet player out on the oval here in Stuyvesant Town, who plays, you know, amazing praise when the saints come marching in. Every night, there's this orchestra that happens, and everybody contributes whatever they do, song, what have you, for five minutes. That's awesome. And now you were got to be part of it as a perfect. New Yorker. This is perfect. Perfect segue, yeah. More cowbell, please. Is, you know. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so... Tell me, you were about yeah. to say you have used binaural I have, uh, and I'd so, love for the audience to know a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, blessed enough to work actually with Monroe Institute, and oh. we have uh, we've created three Mark CDs. Mark Serto, did you work with Mark Serto by any chance? Um, no, I worked with uh, Carol Moore and okay. also uh, um, um, Garrett Stevens, who actually is uh, recently has come on board to Monroe as a as a new part of their program. Okay. Mark as well. is an older working, generation. Yeah, I've been working with Monroe probably, uh, I would say almost like 13 years, somewhere around there. Oh, fantastic. So, so I've done three CDs with Monroe that all, you know, they, they're they really the founders of, of um, including binaural beats with music. You know, yes. they were, they've been, binaural beats have been around for a long time, but yeah. Monroe really was the founders of, I think, really a, a, incorporating it in, a, in an That's unbelievable right. real innovators yeah with, with with integrity and you know and really keeping things uh, consistent with all their things They're, they have amazing engineers there um, but I've also incorporated specific technologies in music outside of Monroe as well mm -hmm. that are incorporating monaural beats and a combination of um, um, monaural beats and also working with heart entrainment so the CD that I did before this one, which is called The Infinite, um, and it's actually working, it's music for heart and brain coherence, actually are incorporating what I call proprietary technologies because they're incorporating um, monorial beats as well as um, certain things I do with heart and brain entrainment oh, and nice. also specific harmonics and intentions that, I, that I'm using as well within, within my music. So, um, you know, there's different ways to create brain synchronization. Some of them, um, such as binaural beats, you have to use headphones with. When you're using monaural beats, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to use headphones with to, um, to create the brainwave entrainment. So I've done mm -hmm. some things with that as well. And, you know, I'm always looking for new and innovative ways to 
move to these states that benefit you know our our health and our quality of life again the four body system mental emotional spiritual and uh, physical aspects of it so the search is constantly evolving you know and and changing you know i'm constantly working with um things that inspire me and that and you know when people ask me what frequencies i use or you know it's it's really what inspires me in that moment you know i sure. you know is, is what i basically what takes me to that state in the moment is what i use you know it's not necessarily what people are talking about in that moment or necessarily what people have found beneficial or non-beneficial you know like any artist you know you don't create thinking about what people are going to like that's right that, you create what moves you first and you hope that that finds its way uh, and ripples out for people who resonate with what you do. And, you know, that's, that's really what music is um, in this day and age is embracing the inner sound healer within each one of ourselves, recognizing that we're all masters within that. That's we have the ability to, to, to know what resonates and doesn't resonate with us. So listening from that point of view, again, where music is something that happens in us, not outside of us. I love that. I love that <laughs> distinction. And applying it. it. It's fair to say, uh, you know, these are beautiful, you know, final words, Barry. Uh, you uh, dance to your own drummer. I think that's a fair comment to make at this point. <laughs> You're not listening to others. You're listening to yourself. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, you yeah. take it. In. I read all the I read all the uh, latest research, and I say, "Oh, that's pretty cool. What would that sound like?" You know, and I'll play around right. with it on my keyboard, and if it resonates, cool. Wow, this is really cool. I'm gonna incorporate this into a piece. If it doesn't, you know, then I don't. You so know? it is. So it is. So it is. Well, Barry Goldstein, I want to just thank you so much, my friend, for being on today. I, I think we made up for some years. I was going to say, I think, we did, I think we did two shows, yeah. yeah. I think we did, yeah. And we needed this. We needed the time for a good schmooze, you know, and really. Connecting with you, Mitch. Mitchell. Really beautiful. Sorry. Thank you so much for your great yeah. work, Barry. Keep and it you up. you too. Thanks for all you've been doing for all these years with your show and, you know, being so active as well. I'm sure people are looking um, to you for for sharing these these amazing shows, especially, you know, in, in I know your show is global, but, you know, also in New York where, yeah. you, you know, you have such a strong presence in, in New York as well. I'm sure people are very thankful, you know, for your work in, in this time. So I, th I thank you for, for doing what you do. My pleasure, my friend. Thank you again. And All right. Words. Okay. God bless. Keep up the good work and we'll, we'll do it again. We still have much more to uh, talk about. I look forward to it. Me too. Thanks, Mitch. So, so welcome. Wow. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It's just really revelatory to speak with Barry Goldstein and learn what it is he's been up to over the course of years of evolution, as I think you heard through this dialogue. It's very enriching. And I think it's really important to keep a very large net open for what creates healing. There's a tendency to narrow and just listen to certain people talk about certain things like drugs, vaccines. Well, you know, let's just be large enough and big enough to say there's a place for almost everything. But taking into consideration what we were just talking about and the kind of work Barry is doing in hospitals, in hospices, shows that there is an increasing interest in gentle, rhythmic, beautiful means of creating healing. And the world is getting the message. So we here at A Better World are so happy to help to support that message. So I wanna thank all of you for tuning in today by television as well as by radio. And you can reach me, of course, at mjr at abetterworld.net mjr at abetterworld.net i love hearing your comments your feelings etc about uh this show and others 
and go visit our website at www.abetterworld.tv and sign up for our weekly newsletter. It's free. It announces our weekly radio and TV shows and a lot else. So thanks again for joining and I look forward to seeing you all next week.